All right, welcome to uh, tonight's uh, New York Giants Preservation Society meeting for Thursday, June 16th. Um, some order of business to take care of, first of all, or all you guys, uh, happy Father's Day. I hope you have a great day on Sunday. I hope you're spoiled. And uh, if your dads are still around, wish them a happy uh, birthday as well. And your sons, well, who is ever a father, or even people who just take care of other people who aren't fathers. Happy Father's Day. Um, sorry about the location I'm in. I contacted COVID, so then the usual giant background is uh, not with me as I am in quarantine in a real girly room here. So uh, I'm sorry for that, but that's how it is. Um, I want to welcome the Casey Stengel chapter on Saber. Uh, some, some of you had wished to... Uh, hop aboard to hear Marty today. And uh, I acquiesced, of course. And if you enjoy what you see tonight and want to come to any future New York Giant Preservation Society meetings, feel free to just email me and say, Gary, uh, add me to the list. Uh, there will be no meeting next week, uh, but the following week, which would be um, June 30th, we have Noel Shearer. He's a curator and he did a magnificent uh, display on the polo grounds by the Morris Jamel mansion a few years back. Um, and he's going to be talking about that and I'll have a video to go along with it. And it'll be about the uh, baseball giants, uh, the, the Titans, the football giants, uh, anything, the Mets and boxing matches and even some huge college uh, football games that were played at the polo grounds. Uh, what else could I tell you? Tonight we have, uh, you know, just a marvelous guest speaker. He's a legendary author and historian on baseball, mostly with the uh, New York Yankees. Probably knows more about the Yankees than anybody. Um, I met Marty a few years back when Monty Irvin had passed away. There was a memorial for him, and I saw Marty was there with Bill White. Uh, I introduce myself. Uh, he's just a really, really uh, lovely man. Uh, Marty has many books out. He's going to be talking initially for a few minutes about his latest book called uh, Pinstripe Empire, um, which was revised in 2020. And if you look at the standings now, uh, Marty might have to revise that to 2022. Um, then, after a couple minutes just telling us about that book, we're going to dive into the Casey Stengel book. Uh, and a lot, some of the questions are going to be related to the uh, New York Giants because that's, he played for the Giants and then learned his craft as a manager from John McGraw. Uh, Marty had asked me, uh, he didn't really, really want to rehash the book, that if I would moderate for him. So I will ask the questions maybe a dozen questions or so. And then once Marty's done with that, the uh, you guys, it's all up to you. All right. How does that, does everybody work with that? We're good with that? Works for me. Perfect. So without any further ado, it is my distinct privilege to welcome Marty Appel to the New York Giants Preservation Society meeting for tonight, June 16th. Thank you so much. I love or do you want to talk books. about your latest book before we delve into the Stengel book? I just wanted to say it's an honor to be here. I love that there are such things as preservation societies for the Giants. There's one for the St. Louis Browns. You guys probably know all of this, but I always try and sort of stay tuned to what's going on with them because it's a beautiful thing about baseball in an era where when we talk about baseball all we talk about is how to fix it not like we used to talk about who's better Willie Mickey or the Duke and now it's how can we shorten the games so groups like this are great great privilege for me to address you thank you for having me our, our privilege and pleasure the um a word about pinstripe empire it actually came out in 2012 I was really proud of it. It started out, I was going to do a biography of Jacob Rupert only. And then as I, was, as I was developing it, I said, you know what? There hasn't been a full history of the Yankees 
since the great Frank Graham wrote one in 1943, published by Putnam, one of their team series history books. And that was updated a few times, but there've been some nice picture books over the years, but there hadn't been a narrative history of the Yankee franchise since Graham in 43, who I think also wrote the New York Giants in that series. Um, so I set about to do it and I became a fan in 1955. So it's like 1903 to 1954 was a lot of research. And 1955 on, it just sort of flowed because I lived it all. It was an interesting writing experience in that sense. And the reason that it's, we're talking about it briefly tonight is that the publisher, Bloomsbury, um, reissued an updated edition last year through the 2020 season. So it's got all that exciting stuff about A-Rod and about Jeter's retirement and Mariano's retirement. And of course, the arrival of Aaron Judge, who's turned out to be a very important Yankee. Um, so that is available only through Kindle. Um, they didn't want to put out a whole new hardcover or softcover book. But if this team continues the way it is, the 2022 team, you're right, Gary, this may call for an update for next year. And uh, I hope it happens. We've got 100 games to go, and they got to win the World Series to really be respected and historic. But uh, <laughs> right now, it's an amazing team to watch. Marty, thank you so much. Um, some of you might be like questioning, well, why, why are we going to be talking about Stengel and the Yankees? You know, the Giants and the Yankees in the early 1900s and 10s and 20s and 30s, very oh, intertwined. Right now? Yeah. Oh. This is very intertwined. Very, um, very. In I'm sorry. Go ahead, Marty. No, you can't tell the Yankee history without the Giants. Um, not only for the years that they shared the polo grounds, but the years that the Giants tried to keep them out of town altogether. <laughs> Um, ben Johnson very much wanted a New York franchise so that the American League could truly be big time. But the Giants had these great political connections and every place that Ben Johnson wanted to put a ballpark, Tammany Hall and the New York politicians influenced by the Giants would veto it and say, nope, not there, you can't put it there. Finally, in uh, 1903, they got permission, well, 1902, they got permission to develop this land where New York Presbyterian Hospital is now up on 168th Street and Broadway. And uh, the Giants said, all right, that's not gonna disturb us. That's nowhere's land, that's undeveloped area. Um, and you can have it. And there was no subway that went up there then. The subway went as far as the polo grounds. And when I was writing the book, I, um, I took that subway ride up to the polo grounds because I wanted to see what fans had to do if they wanted to see the Highlanders for those first few years before there was a subway station. And if you got out at the polo grounds, it was a 10 block walk up Broadway to get to Hilltop Park. So it wasn't so bad. I was kind of pleasantly surprised by that. Um, and the Highlanders played there for a decade before they moved in to share the polo grounds with the Giants. Now I wanna digress for a second because a lot of you, and I know you know your baseball history, may think that the Yankees was a team transferred from Baltimore that started out as the Orioles and then moved to New York to become the Highlanders. And when I did the research for Pinstripe Empire, I came to the conclusion that that is sort of a myth that's carried on over the years, just as the name Highlanders and the name Hilltop Park have carried on all these years. Back in those days, those terms were hardly ever used at all. It was the New York Americans and American League Park. And we've come today to use Highlanders and Hilltop Park more popularly than they did back then. But anyway, um, the Orioles had gone broke in 1902 and went out of business essentially. 
and some of their star players jumped to the Giants during the course of that season. And at the end of the year, there was no franchise move to New York. There were no uniforms moved. There were no contracts moved. There was no furniture moved, nothing. The Highlanders started from scratch. And if you doubt that, then guys on the Orioles like Bresnahan and McGraw and um, McGinnity, they would be considered Yankees in the Hall of Fame if you think of it as one franchise. But of course, nobody thinks of those guys as Yankees at any point. So we have come to accept, and I kind of influenced baseballreference.com and Major League Baseball and even the Yankees, that there's no connection. The Orioles ended a Highlander start and Yankee history goes to 1903. So um, anyway, there was still great animosity. McGraw hated everything about the American League, didn't play a 1904 World Series, which the Highlanders were almost in. And then things softened over the years, partly because the Polo Grounds had this fire and needed a place to play. And the owners of the Highlanders, Frank Farrell and Bill Devery, made Hilltop Park available to them. So that softened the tension a little bit. And then after 1912, the Highlanders moved in as tenants of the Giants. The Giants certainly welcomed the rental money and became the Yankees, dropped Highlanders. And almost, well, starting in 1921, it was Yankees Giants every October for the World Series. 1923 was the first year Yankee Stadium opened and the first year the Yankees won the World Series. And McGraw hated playing in this now bigger ballpark than the Polo Grounds. Polo Grounds had been the great stadium of the United States until Yankee Stadium was built. And then once Yankee Stadium opened and the Yankees got Babe Ruth and the Yankees won the World Series in 23, uh, then it was a full-blown rivalry, which carried on for many decades uh, on through the Willie, Mick, Mickey, and the Duke argument um, until we said goodbye to the Giants after the 57 season. So um, Casey Stengel um, played for Brooklyn, played for New York Giants, managed the Yankees, was a great New York figure, as you know. Um, I wanted to show you one thing, for instance, the cover of the book, when it was first designed, it was a Mets cap that he was wearing. And I called the publisher and I said, <laughs> can't be in a Mets cap on this. I'm kind of known as a Yankee author. So we'll just lower the picture <laughs> so <laughs> that you can't tell the cap at all. But you can, if you're smart, you know that's a Mets jersey he's wearing, and that is a Mets cap, but we pretend that it was an all-purpose cap because he played for everybody. So the book is called um, Baseball's Gr Casey Stengel, Baseball's Greatest Character. And where that came from was when the MLB network started, they used to do all these superlatives. Greatest postseason home runs, greatest this, greatest that. And they did one on baseball's greatest character. So you had a lot of contenders for that. I mean, Leo DeRocher and Yogi Berra and Babe Ruth, but Casey won it. He was called baseball's greatest character, which was a fitting subtitle for the book. And I had two things going for me that the great Bob Creamer didn't have when he did his majestic Casey Stengel book in the eighties. What I had was the internet, which he didn't have. And there's a site on the internet called newspapers.com. And it turns out that most local little daily and weekly newspapers in small town America have digitized their morgue, their files, so that I could go to Kankakee, Illinois, where Casey broke in as a pro. And there's a newspaper from Kankakee. 
And if I enter, search for Dutch Stengel, which he was known as then, up came all of these long lost anecdotes about zany things he did on the baseball field. Because he was a colorful character from the time he set foot in professional baseball. Um, so I discovered all these wonderful long lost anecdotes about him. The Kankakee team, which went out of business in mid season, their field was next to an asylum for the insane, as it was called then. And most of Casey's teammates thought that's where he'd be playing next season. <laughs> then they would point to the insane asylum. <laughs> so he was already developing a reputation. So that was a great little anecdote to start the findings of this book. Um, you guys are baseball historians. You know the 19th century pitcher, 300 game winner, Kid Nichols? Anybody? Yeah. Yeah, that was Casey's neighbor in Kansas City when he was a little boy growing up. And when he became a schoolboy player, his neighbor, Kid Nichols, said to him, you're going to get a lot of advice in your life. Don't throw any of it out. Sort it through, play it out. Some of it will be good. And Casey always remembered that. So we can trace Casey Stengel from Kid Nichols to Tug McGraw and Ron Swoboda. What a span of baseball history that was. And I used to say more conveniently from John McGraw to Tug McGraw, but uh, that, was, that was Casey and this incredible span of baseball history that he covered. Um, his Giants years as a player were interesting because McGraw saw him as a bit of a clown. He had that reputation, of course, but Casey was also a mature player at 30 or 31. He was really 31. Everybody thought he was 30, um, but he looked old. He was already getting lines in his face. He always looked old. And at 30, a veteran player joining the Giants, he was considered to be like this veteran fill-in that we'll use now and then. He was the fourth outfielder. And McGraw thought of him as like, unpredictable, like you didn't know what stunt Casey was gonna come up with tomorrow. Um, yet Casey married his longtime wife, Edna Stengel, while he was playing for the Giants. And McGraw developed sort of a new respect for him because Blanche McGraw liked Edna Stengel. And suddenly this screw up outfielder of his, they would have them at their home in New Rochelle for dinner and the Stengels and the McGraws got along very well as adult couples. Now, Casey, as you probably know, was the star of the 1923 World Series, hitting two game-winning home runs. One of them, the first World Series home run ever hit um, at Yankee Stadium. And the famous story that goes with that is as he was running the bases, he thought he lost a shoe and he was running with one shoe and one barefoot, stocking foot. So he slides home. It's an inside the park home run. And he gets up and he says to Hank Gowdy, I lost a shoe, I lost a shoe. And Hank Gowdy says, well, how many were you wearing, Casey? You got two on. <laughs> so it turned out it was like a rubber insole that flew out of the shoe while he was running. <laughs> so he thought he lost a shoe, but it was like, a little heel protection. But that was Casey, crazy things happened. Anyway, he's like, the Giants lose the 23 series, so he's not quite the hero that he might have been. But he did win both of their victories with home runs in the 1923 series, even though he was a part-time platoon player then, which is where he learned to platoon when he went, later went to manage the Yankees. And then after the 23 World Series, he gets traded to Boston, the lowly Boston Braves. And he said, it's a good thing I didn't win three games or they'd have sent me to jail. <laughs> <laughs> so that, the move to Boston was kind of near the end of his career. One thing I didn't want to skip over was 
there's a famous photo of Casey getting escorted off the field. I'll see if I can find it while I'm talking to you. Um, it, yeah, here it is. Okay, so this is the 23 World Series. And see that picture of him, the police taking him off the field? Yeah. That's an important picture to me, not for him being in the middle of a fight and getting escorted off the field, but it kind of shows that while we think of him as an old bent over man, he was a robust, broad shouldered, big chested guy who was really quite an athlete in his time. And I love that picture for that reason. You can see great athleticism there. So um, anyway, once he goes to Boston, the career winds down pretty quickly and um, he turns to managing. Judge Fuchs, the owner of the Braves, want, needed a manager at Worcester, where the Red Sox farm team is now. Uh, and he dispatched Casey there, and that began Casey Stengel's long managing career, the first half of which was pretty mediocre with second division teams all the time. And then the second half sends him to the Hall of Fame, managing eight Yankee pennant winners in 10 years. Um, so that in a nutshell is my story of Pinstripe Empire and Casey Stengel and um, the Giants connection with the Yankees. And now, Gary. Right. Marty, I, you know, a lot of the, what you said, I, those were some of my questions, but I'm going to do rapid fire with you. I'll sure. ask the questions here and then I'll open it up to everybody else. Um, one thing I, from reading your book, it seemed like he would be a perfect player for today's baseball player. He was always, excuse my language, bitching about his salary every year. <laughs> what, is your, what is your comment about that? It just w went with the territory. I mean, there were no players who didn't. Um, but he always knew the value of the buck and he knew his own worth. So he would put up pretty good uh, salary fights every year. A uh, couple of times he got traded to less interesting teams like the Phillies or the Pirates. And he was very, really vocal about wanting to get out. And when he went from um, the Phillies to the Giants, oh my God, he jumped off the training table and ran outside and ran around the bases in his underwear sliding <laughs> every base he was so excited to go to the giants and be back in the big city when he first went to brooklyn his first major league playing job he stayed in a hotel in times square and he was a little intimidated by um new york city especially how how you get to the polo grounds uh, how you get to Ebbets field from times square through him um, so he would, which we could relate to, I think his hotel was like on 45th street and he'd go out once and he'd walk to 44th street and then back. He'd go in, have a beer, then he'd walk to 43rd street and walk back. And he kept doing this till he'd get down to like 39th, 38th. And he was starting to feel more comfortable, but he had to do it in small steps. So that was very interesting. Um, when he finally owned New York as a lauded manager of the Yankees, he lived in the Essex House on Central Park South, like his whole time as manager of the Yankees, and then his whole time as manager of the Mets. He had the regular suite, they always saved it for him, and that was home. And when he got fired by the Yankees after the 1960 World Series, he got called to come to the Yankee office, which was, if you remember where FAO Schwartz was on Fifth Avenue in that building. So it was really like two and a half blocks away. He would ordinarily take a taxi, even those two and a half blocks. But on that day, he felt he was gonna get a new contract and so he was feeling very good about himself and he decided he's going to walk to 745 Fifth Avenue only to find out he was getting fired. 
So he was sure to take a taxi back since they were still paying his expenses that day. <laughs> and um, that, was, that was a low point for Casey. But um, being a New Yorker, I could relate to those streets and those thoughts. It was interesting. Marty, you, uh, one of your quotes about the book is um, McGraw and Stengel, teacher and student. Could you uh, tell us Say about that? Gary? McGraw and Stengel, teacher and student. Can you explain what? Casey, uh, unlike a lot of the giant players who didn't want to be anywhere near McGraw because he had such a bad temper, Casey liked to sit next to McGraw on the Giants bench and he learned a lot, things he thought he knew about baseball. Um, one day, Frankie Frisch made a terrific play on a ground ball, threw the guy out at first. And Casey's like, what a great play. And McGraw is muttering to himself, he goes, that wasn't a great play. He shouldn't have had to have dived for the ball. And if he'd fielded it cleanly, it should have been a double play. Now we got a terrible inning ahead of us. And Casey's like, yeah, you're right, you know. And he started to absorb things that would later be important to him uh, as a manager. So he learned a lot from McGraw. He had tremendous respect for him, even if it wasn't duplicated, even if McGraw didn't have that much respect for Casey. But I think he, I think he knew that Casey was learning as he was sitting there. And the fact that he wasn't sitting at the far end of the dugout, that impressed McGraw, that he wasn't intimidated by him. And uh one of the main things that he did learn was the platoon system? Absolutely. Now, platoon system only works if you've got a second line of players who are good players, which he always had with the Yankees. But McGraw was early in doing analytics, the word we hate, where he knew righty against lefty, lefty against righty, what worked, what didn't, who played well against this pitcher over the course of the season. So uh, Casey studied that for McGraw and that became part of his uh, managing prowess, even if it didn't work so well as some of the bad teams he managed. Now, you also said he was sort of like the clown prince. Can you, can you explain to the people who didn't read the book or don't know the whole incident with the uh, bird under his hat um, <laughs> incident? So that which... was, um, he had been with Brooklyn and then he went to uh, Pittsburgh. And this one day, he was in the, uh, in the bullpen. Um, he wasn't playing, so he was sitting with the relief pitchers in the bullpen. And he scoops up this little sparrow and puts it under his hat and puts the hat over the bird. And then he gets called into the game. And when he's introduced, this was in Brooklyn in front of his old fans. And when he's introduced as a pinch hitter, he takes off the cap and the bird flies out. <laughs> and it became forever part of Casey's legend, uh, even to the 1960s, <coughs> they would do cartoons of Casey bowing with the bird flying out. It was you know, kind of his way of giving, the, uh, giving his old team the bird. bird. <laughs> you know, uh, I remember watching the Met games and they would always say the old professor, but I know from reading your book, that's not, um, he didn't get that later on in life. He got that when he was basically just at the beginning of his career, career correct? Yeah, he actually picked up the nickname. It, it stuck when he was with the Yankees because of his seeming wisdom and making lineups and winning pennants. But very early in his career, he took a winter job, an off-season job as an assistant baseball coach at Ole Miss. University of Mississippi. So um, he got his start managing with that experience. But another thing that happened was he was going to dental school. <clears throat> oh, so at Ole Miss, he couldn't just be an assistant coach. He had to teach a class. So from that, he became a professor. Um, but also, um, he went to dental school, uh, which some of you may recall having read. And uh, that was, he went three off seasons to dental school in Kansas City, his hometown, hence KC, KC. 
Uh, so he goes to the middle school for three, three winters. And in the third winter, they call him in uh, to the office and they say, we gotta be honest with you, Dutch or Charles. Uh, they don't make dental equipment for left-handers. <laughs> it's gonna be a real struggle for you to have a career in dentistry and you ought to think about giving it up. To which I wrote, because I didn't see this quoted in any place, how did he get to a third semester? <laughs> Nobody had thought of this before. Wouldn't you think they would have thought of this the first day? But um, today they make dental equipment that's easily convertible to lefty righty. Back then it was impossible for a left-hander to be a dentist and yet he went three semesters. So go figure. How is um how's my moderating? I'm I'm all right with you right now. We good? You're one of the best moderators ever. <laughs> all right, let me continue. Again, uh Marty asked me to come up with questions, and then once I'm done with mine, uh we're gonna we're gonna open it up for you. Uh the Stangalee stuff. Was this later on in his life, or was it basically that was his how he was and said whatever? He perfected that along the way. It was when he wanted to avoid answering a question, he would double talk, which came to be known as Stengelese. It wasn't called Stengelese until <coughs> the 40s. Uh, but before then, he was famous for avoid, you know, if you he, rather than criticize one of his players, he would double talk and the reporter would get no answer at all. But that was early Stengelese. That's great. Uh, so later, he starts perfecting his managerial uh, ways, uh, lines up with the Yankees, wins an incredible amount of championships and World Series. Uh, some have questioned, was he that good of a manager or did he have that good of a lineup and roster? Well, it's both. I mean, he obviously had the horses. And remember, as great as it was to win all those pennants, and all those world championships. You only had seven teams you had to beat and one round of postseason. So it's a lot easier than it was today. <clears throat> and the Yankees did tend to have the best players and the biggest payroll and spend the most money and they could sign whoever they wanted because there was no draft. So it all favored the Yankees a lot in case he was the beneficiary of that, but he certainly I mean, he would piss some players off who weren't playing as much as they thought they should. <clears throat> but he knew what he was doing. He had a good pitching coach in Jim Turner. And on they went year after year. So, Marty, we get to the 60s and he loses to the Pirates and gets uh, dismissed, I guess. Yep. Um, what Was that dismi uh, dismissal solely based on age? They try to make it seem like age. One of the big factors, which doesn't seem so significant today, is that his first base coach, Ralph Houck, was considered the next great manager. Everybody in baseball coveted Ralph Houck. And the Yankees were concerned they would lose Houck to Boston. They were dangling offers in front of them. So with a successor right there that they didn't want to lose, they decided to unplug Casey after the 1960 World Series. What would have happened if he won that seventh game? Nobody really knows, but he lost and it made it easier for them. At the press conference where they fired him, where he said, I was told my services were no longer required. Uh, they made a big deal of giving him a parting gift of a check for $160,000, which was big money in 1960, of course. And uh, they made it like a presentation of appreciation for the years you've given us. Actually, he was part of a profit sharing plan that all the employees were in. And that was his profit sharing plan from, from 1949 to 1960. So they were giving him money he was totally entitled to. And I know about that plan because when I joined the Yankees in 1968, I was in the same plan. 
except we never had a profit in those days. So I never got anything. <laughs> That's great. So uh, he leaves the Yankees and then winds up his career uh, managing the, the amazing Mets or <laughs> For the lack of a better word, we know that they were one of the worst teams in baseball history. Um, and everybody's seen the films, you know, Metsy, Metsy, Metsy. And he, he turns out to be a great ambassador for the National League and the Mets. Um, just honestly, do you feel his number should be should have been retired by the Mets? Was it something important or just a yeah, nice way um, to thank him for everything he did in New York? I think he should have been retired by the Mets and I'm glad he was because he did for them what few managers have ever done. He really put that franchise on the map. All they had to do was compete with the champion Yankees and he did it. He drew all the attention over there while he had a terrible team. He drew attention away from the field and onto himself. And um, he was a great, great salesman for that team. You know, I, digress a little bit because this isn't really about Casey this is about George Weiss who of course was the general manager of the Yankees and got fired the same time Casey did now George Weiss was considered humorless past turn um, he knew how to build great ball clubs but there was nothing personable about George Weiss and the famous story was somebody went to George Weiss with the Yankees with the idea of a cap day, which they could get for like 75 cents a cap. It would cost them and every kid coming to the game would get a Yankee cap. And Weiss supposedly slammed his fist on the desk and said, do you think I want every kid in this town walking around in a Yankee hat? As though that was a terrible idea. <laughs> so, that was Weiss. And now Weiss goes over the Mets, has no success putting together a good team at all. But suddenly, everything he creates was perfect. Much of it's still existing today. I mean, he hired Casey. He hired Lindsey Nelson, Ralph Kiner, and Bob Murphy, who were great. The Meet the Mets song, the Let's Go Mets cheer, the logo, so much that has carried on all these years were under George Weiss's watch. So it's kind of a remarkable turnaround that all of a sudden he became a genius when it came to promotion. Marty, thank you so much. Gentlemen, uh, I know you got much better questions than I have, but uh, I did as best as I could, but it was a fantastic read uh, and I really highly recommend it. And Marty, I guess the best way to get the Stengel book is through Amazon. Yeah, sadly, the neighborhood bookstores are few and far between now. Um, I'd like to patronize the neighborhood stores, but Amazon certainly created a model for ease and comfort. That's so, um, that's, and it's the only way to get the updated pinstripe empire. And if you're a student of baseball history, you kind of got to know Yankee history too. It's one and the same. All right, we're going to go to Mars, then Bill, then Steve, then Jeff, then Harvey. Mars, you're up. And me, I'm on. Thank you. <laughs> Perry and okay. then Frank. Uh, hi, Marty. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, I have a uh, wanted to let you know what probably many of our uh, club members know. I was born in Columbia Presbyterian Hospital, uh, the site of Hilltop Park. Uh, but I wanted to follow up on what Gary uh, mentioned about Stengel as manager. Uh, here it is, uh, your, your owners buy the best players, just like John McGraw did the, when the Giants had their dynasty in the beginning of the 20th century. Some teams couldn't even pay their railroad expenses and McGraw would get the best players. Well, that's what the Yankees did with Colonel Rupert and, and Hudson. And uh, they got the best players from the faltering teams like the Senators, you know, and and uh, and uh, so here it is. You get the best players and any manager uh, could succeed for pretty much. So, uh, you know, you'd, uh, like so when he won five World Series in a row with the Yankees, the running joke amongst my friends were 
my grandmother could have penciled in a line, a lineup just by going eeny, meeny, miny, mo and won the World Series. And then he goes to the Mets and he loses 120 games because you, what are you going to do? Platoon Marv Throneberry for Choo Choo Coleman? <laughs> So was there a question in there? Yeah. So what the, the question is, um, well, what, uh, did any time in the uh, humble beginnings of the Mets, did they outdraw the Yankees? Because the Mets fans were starved for a National League team. Yeah, they outdrew them when Shea Stadium opened because um, new ballparks tend to draw big crowds. And it was part of the whole World's Fair scene then, too. <clears throat> so... Really, within three years, the Mets were out drawing the Yankees, which and the Yankees were going through bad times then, starting in 1965. Um, so a lot of a lot of the dynamics of New York baseball was changing, and people always said, long after the Giants and Dodgers left, that New York is at heart a National League town, and we saw it with the resurgence of the Mets in the 80s when they were really interesting and really good. And the Yankees always have to look over their shoulder because that possibility is still lurking out there, especially with the population of Long Island and the way they would flock to Shea Stadium to support the Mets. And by the way, you mentioned Columbia Presbyterian Hospital. So when I was doing Pinstripe Empire, I know that Alex Rodriguez was born in Washington Heights. So I thought, well, if he was born in Washington Heights, wouldn't it be interesting if he was born at that hospital too, where the Highlanders started? <clears throat> so you can imagine how it went when I called Columbia, now New York Presbyterian Hospital and asked them if their records would show uh, that an Alex Rodriguez was born there. And of course they quoted HIPAA rules to me that they couldn't reveal any information about yeah. any of the patients. So I lost that. But then I asked Alex and he said, I don't know, there were 25 hospitals in Washington Heights and he had no idea which was his. So so do you consider Stengel a great manager because the ownership, the GM would get the players or did Stengel have an input in getting those players? He had a little input. I mean, Weiss respected him and the two of them had known each other since they were both in the Eastern League. Um, but basically, uh, you know, Weiss knew if this guy got hurt, we got to have a backup ready. So let's go get, and you know, they had so much wealth there besides their regular infielders. There was Gil McDougal and there was Billy Martin and there was Andy Carey and such depth on the bench that Guys never knew if they were playing or not. Bobby Richardson said he was a really hard guy to play for, Casey, because you never knew if you were playing or not. You couldn't anticipate it over breakfast. You didn't know till you got to the ballpark. And then sometimes he'd embarrass Bobby by hitting him ninth and have the pitcher hit eighth. And Bobby went on to twice be a 300 hitter. So, um, yeah, he, Casey could be tough to play for, and he didn't really care about the players' feelings one drop. When Billy Martin got traded in 57, uh, he was Casey's boy, and Billy expected Casey to stop that trade and keep him in New York. Um, and Billy would always be telling people, where was the old man when I needed him? He didn't stand up for me. And finally, after hearing this so many times, Casey said to reporters, tell Billy Martin to grow up. This is his profession. People get traded all the time. Stop whining. Go play ball. So yeah. Casey could be tough like that. Thanks. Thank you, Marty. Thanks, Mars. Bill hey. Plank, you're up. Okay. okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much, Marty. Um, like many of us, not really a Yankee fan, but certainly a Yankee respecter. Uh, the first game I ever saw at Yankee Stadium, I still have the sub from August 30th, 31st, 1970. I know that day, it was the day after I met my wife. So I met my wife, then I went to Yankee Stadium. I, I'll i still keep it in that order. Uh, Bill Haber, who I think you know from, yeah, from yeah. Tops, was my host, and he got a seats behind home plate. And I saw, uh, uh, you know, I saw Hamilton throw an Ephus pitch. So it was it was a lot of fun. Let wow. me take you back, though, if I could, uh, to 
the stepping stone for him to become a Yankee manager. Uh, there's a few of us here, not many, who are PCL uh, aficionados, and he uh, managed that, that great uh, Oakland team with the then known as the eight old men. Uh, and I just plus wondered. Plus Billy Martin. Plus Billy Martin. Yeah. And, well, he had. Yeah. He brought Billy Martin along. Yeah. You get me and Billy. But when he could you talk about that transition, how the Yankees uh, found him under the re radar score screen or on top of the radar screen there with the. Uh, good old Oakland A, Oakland Oaks out of uh, Emeryville. Okay, well, you trigger a few memories for me. Number one, the importance of the PCL was they were really a third major league, even though they were considered minor leagues, of course. But uh, when there were only 400 major leaguers, and today there's over a 1,000, you could say that the next 600 best were major league ability back in the days when there were just 16 teams. And the PCL, PCL was a very high level of play. So when Casey won championships in Oakland, it got everybody's attention and the sporting news played it up big. And there was speculation that Casey would somehow find another major league job. Now his wife, Edna, oh, he, so he gets an offer from Weiss to come to the Yankees. And Edna says, what do you want this for? We're so happy here. We live in California. You're the hero of Oakland. Don't do it. Let's stay here. And Casey says, I'm just going to do it for one year. I got to prove that I can play, manage a team with good players because he never had. So he goes back east, signs a two-year deal with George Weiss and keeps renewing it every two years till it becomes 10 years. And um, of course, he goes from there to Cooperstown. But that's what, when you say Oakland, it triggers the memory of his being a big man in Oakland. He was. Never played for, never paid for a meal. He was the toast of the town, parades after they'd win championships. And to, he had old players on the team who he knew from his playing days. And he was having a great time. And Edna wanted him to stay. You don't need the Yankees. You don't need to go back to the major leagues. But he went, and it was a good move. Thank when you very much, Marty. Mets, because we mentioned that before, Gene Autry wanted him to manage the Angels, which was really close to their home in Glendale, California. And again, he was very tempted, but George Weiss was very persuasive to get him to come back. And part of that was to show up the Yankees. Come on, let's, let's shake up this town and show the Yankees something. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Steve Rothschild and Jeff Cohen. Great presentation, Marty. You're really a, a gem. And Gary, both of you, kudos, because look at the numbers of people we have in here tonight. Um, both my kids were born in Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center. And Marty, I taught up there for 35 years on 177th in St. Nicholas. In fact, Manny Ramirez was on my sixth grade basketball team in 1985. That's just one story. Um, I played I in the Central Park Softball League a few years ago. I thought, I can still do this. I'm going to sign up for this league. And I showed up. Everybody in the league was Manny Ramirez. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I got to get out of here. <laughs> but oh, go ahead. I, I started doing tours of Yankee Stadium. Ah. My last six or seven years teaching, twice a year. I went in November and again in April. And I met Tony Moranti, who was the right. Tommy Lasorda of the Yankees. And... He didn't even realize it. He stopped on one of the levels and he pointed to where Hilltop Park was. Because right. we were reasonably close to that, that area. My question to you is not related to your book. I had an exchange with Lindsay Berra a couple of weeks ago. That's another story. And it turns out that she's involved in a documentary on Yogi, which I'm sure you know about. I saw I, it Saturday at the Tribeca Film Festival. That's what I wanted to ask you. I know she was looking for somebody to pick it up so it could be purchased. Are you aware of anything? No, this, that's how the process works. They get these screenings at the film festivals and scouts from uh, film studios and from networks, they're there too, just like scouts look for me, look for ball players. So I loved it and, you know, I'm not being prejudiced because I like Lindsay and I loved Yogi, but um, I thought it was, 
certainly something, if it was on Netflix, I would absolutely watch it and enjoy every minute of it. Okay. So I hope it gets picked up and everybody has a chance to see it. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. My Jeff pleasure. Cohen. Jeff, you're up. Thanks, Gary. Marty, I read your book a couple of years ago. It was a, a great book. I really enjoyed it. And I'll pass this course a couple of times at Sabre events and at my temple. So I, you know, thank you for joining us. I got two questions. One, could you uh, tell us about the Casey Stengel Senate testimony and how that all came about? And my second question is, do you have a favorite Casey Stengel quote? Um, the Senate hearing where he rambled on in Stengelese in front of the Senate Antitrust Committee looking into baseball's antitrust exemption. This was the day after the All-Star Game, which was played in um, Baltimore. So they were able to get Ted Williams and Casey Stengel and Mickey Mantle. And for some reason, Eddie Yost, they were from Major League Baseball and they testified <clears throat> at this committee. And it was filmed, so it still exists and it's memorable. And they asked Casey one question to sort of getting, get it started. And Casey began talking about his first year at Kankakee. And like 25 minutes later, he told his whole life story, not necessarily in order and sequence. <laughs> and everybody was laughing and, you know, it was a hysterical moment, uh, much funnier than today's Senate hearing, I would say, than today's congressional hearing. <laughs> and um, Mickey Mantle followed Casey. You probably know how this goes. And they asked Mickey a question and Mickey said, well, I, I agree with Casey. I go along with everything he said. <laughs> oh, the, you had a part two there. Um, yeah, what was your favorite, favorite quote? your favorite quote? Yes. I still use it a lot because he, he used to say in his later years, most people my age are dead at the present time. <laughs> so it suggested that the present time wasn't necessarily the final answer to it. And it's also funny because he was commenting on his own advancing age. Thanks, Jeff. Harvey Weinberg, you're Thank up. Thank you. Barney, wonderful talk. Uh, just to put in context, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to throw some names at you that are more contemporary. You started your talk by mentioning the connection between the Yankees and the Giants. Just to put it in perspective, I was born in Brooklyn, raised in the Bronx, naturally became a New York Giants fan. It follows, absolutely. And the answer to the question of Willie Mickey or the Duke, remember the name of this group. It's, it's been legislated that it's Willie. And as a matter of fact, there's a, a, um, uh, a video of Mickey, Willie, and the Duke. And Mickey turns to the Duke and he says, tell the truth, Dick, uh, Duke, Willie was the best. But here's my question. Can I interrupt for a second? You certainly can. I agree with Mickey. As a Yankee loyalist and as a friend of Mickey's, I always wanted it to be Mickey. But at the baseball writers dinner at the Sheraton Center in 1995, <clears throat> they honored the three of them. And Mickey got up, this was the last year of his life as it turned out. But Mickey got up and he says, well, I know they're always talking about who was the best from the three of us, but let me tell you, it was Willie. And that was like a relief for all of us that we were now free to acknowledge. Of course, it was Willie Mays, best baseball player of my lifetime. That's all. Um, the San Francisco Giants have a connection, a good connection to the Yankees. And I wonder if you worked with him. And that's Brian Sabian. Brian worked with the Yankees. I know he did. Um, and uh, he's largely responsible for three world championships, 2010, 12, and 14. Did you ever work with Brian? Briefly, not at the, in the front office at the same time. We know each other, you know, through baseball. Um, those three world championships at San Francisco, remember, they're more recent than the Yankees' last one. <clears throat> and when Yankee fans say, well, we haven't won since 2009, you know what, they've been in only that 2009, that's their only World Series in the last 19 years. So somehow, despite these great teams year after year, we are going through a really long dry spell on this. Uh, Brian was 
not going to become the general manager of the Yankees because Brian Cashman was going to be there forever. And that's played out. So it was great that Brian Sabian could go to San Francisco and work his magic with Dave Rigetti as pitching coach. Right. And he also had, he brought in uh, Dick Tidrow, yep. uh, who was, uh, we lost a year or so ago. Right. Um, a, a brilliant scout. Um, and the other name I would throw at you or suggest to you is Al Rosen. Uh, did you ever have any contact with uh, Mr. Rosen? Yeah, lots. Now, he was effectively retired from baseball for a long time, maybe 25 years. And he was actually working at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas, far removed from baseball. He was on the executive level of hotel management there. Steinbrenner, you know, is from Cleveland. He knew Al Rosen through business in Cleveland and, of course, as a ball player. And he was determined that Al Rosen was going to be Gay Paul's successor and um, become the president of the Yankees. So this leads me to another story that has nothing to do with anything. But since you mentioned Al Rosen, <laughs> the, uh, there was going to be a coin toss. Anybody know this story? A coin toss to decide whether the Yankees or the Red Sox would host a playoff game in 1978. Oh, wow. It turned out to be the Bucky Dent game. Bucky F and Dent, they call him in uh, Boston. Exactly. So anyway, there's going to be this coin toss at the American League office in New York. <clears throat> Al Rosen is going to go represent the Yankees. And um, who was representing Boston? Dick O'Connell. But Dick O'Connell is on the phone. So Lee McPhail flips the coin. Al Rosen calls heads and it comes up tails. The game's going to be in Fenway Park. Well, it turns out that was a good thing for the Yankees because Bucky <laughs> Dent's home run was not going to be a home run in Yankee Stadium. But anyway, Rosen has a car phone and he's driving back to Yankee Stadium. And he calls Mr. Steinbrenner and says, yeah, well, we lost the coin toss, so the game's going to be in Fenway Park. And Mr. Steinbrenner goes, what? You lost the coin toss. What did you call? <laughs> and Rosen says, so I, th I think heads. Heads, you moron. Everybody knows it comes out tail 75% of the time. <laughs> <laughs> so that was life working for George Steinbrenner, even if you were the president of the Yankees like Al Rosen was. <laughs> thank Marty, you, thank you so much. Next time you have to make a call on a coin toss. <laughs> Thank you, Harvey. All right. Uh, the pecking order, we got Perry, Frank, Noel, and Andy. Perry, you're up. Perry, there you go. Thanks. So I apologize. Perry. Hi, everybody. Hi, Marty. Hey, how's the neighborhood? <laughs> Love it, especially when you're back. Uh, I haven't been back since before you moved. So one of these days. But um <clears throat> Um, anyway, uh, it's 100 degrees down here, and my iPad kept overheating. That was why I disappeared a few times. But I'm now on my laptop, so hopefully that won't happen. So here, I have a copy of your book down here in Florida with me. Love um, it. And I love it, but I have to, uh, have to tell you that I think you may agree with me that you may call Stengel baseball's greatest character, but uh, our good friend, Arthur Richmond, sure runs a close second. And Arthur and George Weiss were kind of connected at the hip, right? Weren't right. they? Yeah, yeah, Arthur was a great character, worked for the Mets and the Yankees after a distinguished career as a journalist and a friend to us both. And yes. Perry, 16 minute umpire delay in the game last night. Did you read about uh that? Uh, oh, no, I've been working a tournament like 18 hour days on the field in this brutal heat. It was Phil, I'm, Cuzzy's, I'm in a day. <laughs> it was Phil Cuzzy's crew. And okay. there was confusion over whether Aaron Boone could take his pitcher out um, at that particular juncture in the game because uh -huh. it was a question of how many visits to the mound. Right. This is one of those new new rules that yeah, they've instituted. Sort of like in a second visit without another pitch having been thrown. 
Uh -huh. So the four umpires did not know the answer, and there was a 16 minute delay while Ooh. they discussed it among themselves. Oh, and they, yeah. and they, called, they called down and low to uh, the uh, replay center to get their opinion too. Yeah. Wow, and it took 16 minutes? Yeah. yeah. The rule was, the Something rule was is put in to speed up the game. I know. Of course, it, that rule it, is designed to speed up the game. Yes. <laughs> the, the oh, the irony. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyway, my only other uh, comment is that I love all of your books, but of course, my favorite is the one you wrote with Eric Gregg. Um, which is just that one of fun, I, that's for sure. I've read every umpire book there is, and yours is definitely one of the best, Marty. Seriously, oh, thank and thank you for, um, of course, choosing him to write about because he was such an interesting guy. And you know, now he's gone, and just to have his life on record in your words, you know, through his voice, is uh, to me, it's a great gift. Everybody in the room know who Eric Gregg was? And Eric's son, uh, Kevin, is now the PR director of the Phillies. Their home. I didn't know that. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Oh, great. That's good to know. Thank you so much. Harry, great seeing you again. Frank Lewis, you're up. <laughs> well, first, I want to th I, I want to thank um, I want to thank Marty for the presentation and that. Uh, this is uh, Casey and Mickey testifying before the um, antitrust committee that's um, available on YouTube. I mailed it to Gary and he can uh, send it out. Now, my question is not about Casey, but about the um, Yankee uniforms. They call themselves pinstripes, I think, because they were the first team to have pinstripes. Many others have had them since. But uh, the uniforms are so reactionary. The, the Visiting uniforms, they look like truck drivers and, and sanitation workers. And the home uniforms, they look like um, hospital attendants and barbers. Do they ever think of changing their uniforms, modernizing? <laughs> um, the pinstripe is difficult to construct also. Um, it's, it's not easy. And people who paint ball player art find the pinstripes to be endlessly boring to get those pinstripes in. Uh, <laughs> but no, there's certainly been variations on the Yankee uniform over this last decade when it becomes more fashionable to present alternative look. But um, if anything, there's sort of a call for them to wear the pinstripes on the road, even if they're gray pinstripes, because it's so identified with the team. Mm -hmm. um, three years ago, the Yankees played the Red Sox in London, you may recall. I was there. And uh, the organizers in London insisted that the Yankees wear the pinstripes, even if they were the visiting team, which they were in the first game of the two games. So. Uh, it's so in demand uh, and it's so identifiable with the Yankees. With the Yankees, you know, there's gonna be overload on tradition. They're not gonna put names on the uniforms. Um, they didn't even have cardboard cutouts during the pandemic games. I mean, it was just not a Yankee kind of thing to do. Thank you, Frank. No Hind. Thank you. No Hind, you're up. Thank you. Hi, Marty. A uh, question going back to the 1950s. Um, as you, as everybody here knows, the Yankees win five pennants and world championships in a row until um, uh, 1954. 55, the Dodgers win. 56, the Yankees finally win again. 57, the White Sox were in first place for most of the season until maybe about the beginning of September, the end of August. My question is, was Casey worried about his job at that point? Or what would you think? Well, I don't know the answer for sure. He wasn't that secure in his position that he never gave thought to that. Um, to be working in baseball is to be insecure by nature. <laughs> Um, and if the Yankees were not riding high in the standings, I'm sure that would be running through his mind. 
although I don't think it was on his mind on after losing in 1960 and walking over to 745 Fifth Avenue where he got fired. Um, but yeah, each season, if they weren't going to finish first, <clears throat> he was going to be concerned. That yeah, because 57 was also the, the season of the Copacabana incident. Right. And uh, the Yankees were starting to get some bad publicity. They'd been, they'd been free of it. Um, they pretty much had a free ride through the first part of the 1950s. Well, everybody um, did. The writers who traveled with the team, with the team picking up travel expenses and the bar tabs, uh, <laughs> the teams and the players really never got criticized or exposed for bad behavior. But when this happened at the Copacabana in 1957, um, it couldn't be hidden because you had all the gossip journalists at the Copa looking for a story, and that was a big one. So yep. um, it was hard to hide that. And by the way, Noel, I enjoy your books a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Me. Thank you, Noel. Good to see you. Andy Bumgarner. You. Andy, take off your mute. Right now. Okay, hey. I'll try to go fast. First of all, I probably need the services of Casey the dentist. But, Marty, <laughs> unlike, unlike Al Simmons, when Grove Streak ended, Al Simmons had gone to the dentist. And I think a, an obscure outfielder made an error. Grove lost. Grove was pissed at um, not the outfielder, the new guy, but Simmons. Anyway, you're like Lefty Grove. You're among the greats. I love the book on Stengel. And I love the presentation. Quick link. Gary mentioned Giants and Yankees. Here's only I could come up with this. Tampa bidding for a third straight title in hockey. 25th time a team has two championships and made the final bidding for the third. First time Yankees deny the Giants in 23. And we'll leave it at that. Mentioning Casey, I think he's one of the greatest. He won. He was criticized in 60. But why don't you talk about Bob Turley in 58 and maybe even Bob Kazaba? He made a lot of unconventional moves that did work out. And thanks He had again. guys who he could get the most out of, and sometimes not for more than a year or two. Turley in 58, by 59 and 60, he was no longer Bob Turley. Uh, Kozava okay? played two World Series in a, in a row. Uh, it's funny because it's off track, but I was thinking of this the other day. The best five-man rotation that the Yankees may have ever had is the one they have right now, because there haven't been that many years of five-man rotations. Right. But the five-man rotation right now may be the best five. The best four was probably Reynolds, Rashi, Lopat, and Ford. The best three, Reynolds, Rashi, Lopat, before Ford. The best two, Ruffing and Gomez. And the best one, I would say, was Ron Guidry when there was really nobody else supporting that. The, so one just last an observation thing, I, think, I had about mostly about the current five-man rotation. They won when they had obviously the power and great everyday players. But even the the Tory years, the pitching, it's and that will decide it this year as well in all likelihood. But again, thank you so much. You're welcome. You mentioned Al Simmons. Uh, sometimes I talk about how kids today don't know their baseball history. And Simmons is one of the guys I mentioned along with Geringer, Pie Trainer, uh, that today's avid young baseball fans have no idea who we're talking about. Those guys sort of lost to history. Now to say something on behalf of these kids, we were all around the same age. When we were growing up, we had like 50 years to catch up on and 400 players a year. Right. It was somehow manageable. Today, if you're just getting into baseball today at age eight, you got 130 years, you got a thousand players a year. It's really difficult. So I respect today's kids who want to learn baseball history and I have no expectation that they're going to learn all those guys. Just my two cents. Marty, when were you the uh, TV producer of Yankee baseball? Late 80s, early 90s. 
Yeah, you know, I, I want to say one thing. I used to love, uh, you know, I'm not a Yankee fan, but I used to love watching the Yankees. And when they hit home runs in the old Yankee stadium, the backdrop of the Bronx courthouse was fabulous. And I really <laughs> miss that now with the new stadium not facing, you know, that direction. That was just, you know, one of the things I used to really enjoy when I'd watch a Yankee highlight was the ball going up and then in the courthouse in the back in right field. Very much I, missed today on my part, anyway. Nice memory. I worked in the I worked in the Bronx courthouse. Uh, from I'm the surprised you weren't in jail there, Frank. Come on. <laughs> um, and, uh, and also from the top floor, from the library in the top floor, you could see part of the. We field. had a batting practice pitcher who used to pitch for the Cubs named Vito Valenzuela. Yeah, I knew I knew him very well. I worked with him in the New York court system. He, okay. He needed that extra job. He had a day job in the court. And he pitched batting practice for the Yankees and Mets at night to support his 10 kids. Totally correct. But what you didn't know is that he used to bring Fritz Peterson and me up to sit in on trials <laughs> in midday. You know, like if there'd be a night game, Fritz would come early and we'd go together to uh, sit in on a trial as guests of Vito. Why Fritz Peterson? He was interested. Oh, okay. And and you two, what what kind of trials? Like murder trials or divorce I don't trials? I remember that they were murder trials, but they were jury trials. So okay. uh, there was a lot at stake. All right. You, Marty, we can't thank you enough. Has anybody have a question who has not asked one who needs it definitively answered? Renee, uh, go ahead. Renee? I do have one. <laughs> Marty, I got a question. Uh, it, it doesn't pertain to the book, but it pertains to the Yankees and Yankee Stadium. Uh, did you like, uh, uh, do you personally like the move that they did with the new ballpark as opposed to, you know, uh, renovating the original, like what uh, Chicago did and what Boston did, keep the history where home plate is, where, it, you know, there, you know, with all the ex Yankee players and former players of both leagues played there? I, mean, I would have liked them to fix up Yankee Stadium too, we'll call it. Um, if, okay, you know, yeah, I agree because as far as history is concerned, yeah, but right. when they moved out of Yankee Stadium 2 in 2008, I heard so much nostalgia for oh, the original place was the great one, Yankee Stadium 1. And believe me, no escalators, um, right. no blocking right. your view, obstructed view, yep. nobody had a lot of love for the original stadium, and when the Yankee Stadium 2 opened, everybody thought, this is great. This is what comfort and luxury is all about. But that had long been forgotten when the memory was just, oh, Yankee Stadium 1, where I saw my first game, that was the best. So <laughs> time heals. Uh, well, you know what, for me, uh, uh, I, you know, I'm not a big Yankee, I'm not a Yankee fan, but I did my tour, so to speak, of all uh, ballparks in the 80s, Memorial Park, Tiger Stadium, you know, and, and I, I'm telling you, when they remodeled it, I, I was one of the few. There was other people that were like saying, "Why? Why? There's something historic about this." I was that, money, that, that was more luxury of, boxes. Yeah, the same thing with Wrigley. Wrigley was unbelievable in the '80s, and Comiskey Park. I was like, "Oh my God, this is unbelievable!" Yeah, pillars everywhere, but wow, walking around that ballpark and Fenway yeah. too. I mean, I couldn't go to the bleachers, but was a, a unbelievable sights uh, to watch a game. Unbelievable sights. Now, the nice thing about the current ballpark. I went to the current Concession ballpark. areas are all open and you can watch right. the game while you're online and while you're buying right. your foods. In the old stadium, it was blocked off. Right, right, right. I mean, black character. Though. Really big thing that you never hear talked about. The old stadiums, if you had a bleacher seat, that's where you stayed. There was no access to the grandstand. To the that's right. The that's right. And today right. you can circumvent the entire field, right. take in all the different concessions, see the game from different angles. Nobody is saying, hey, this is a bleacher ticket. You belong back there. Right. So in that sense, it's a big improvement. And also, Thank you. in the new Yankee Stadium, there are much better facilities for the women's bathroom. Yeah, there are more there than no, 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 don't, don't get me wrong. I, I would have loved it to stay there. But ever, seeing the improvements that uh, the Cubs did, what Boston is doing, I mean, I, I, maybe I'm a, I'm a history got fan, 
and to see that ballpark still there, that home plate, and you know all the names that that went up to the plate, that went under the field you know, over the the whole entire period of, of their existence in that old ballpark, gone, gone. Well, R- Renee Steinbrenner wanted more luxury boxes. It was could have done it remodeling. Could have done it remodeling it there, right, but you know, leaving he it there. Took over, he took over Bakum's Dam Park, and that shut out the public schools from playing ball there. And, and instead, they had some artificial turf surface on the roof before they finally made Old Yankee Stadium three, I believe, three diamonds for the public schools. Steinbrenner didn't give a damn about the public schools. Or the umpires. I used to umpire games uh, there, right there. And the major league umpires that would umpire the Yankee games would stop by and watch back in the old days. Nice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was it was fun. Yeah. Marty, you got you got room for uh, time for one more? Sure. George Greger, you're up. Anybody know the Yankee score, by the way? <laughs> I'm gonna check. What about the Mets score? Yeah, Yank. Uh, Yank. I don't hear it. <laughs> by the way, Marty, uh, the New York Giants had pinstripes before the Yankees. The pinstripes were for Babe Ruth to make them look thinner. <laughs> um, maybe, but the it's Yankees, nothing Yankees. Yankees had pinstripes even in like 1908 and 07. They had tried them. Brewers and the Mets were tied at one and the fourth. And Yankees um, are no the Yankees the and Rays are right. Exactly. George Marty. Gregor, go ahead. Good. good. Good presentation, Marty. I hope you have uh, my Did You Know book uh, where you'll see that Kid Nichols has the record of seven 30, 30 game, 30 win seasons, uh, all with the Boston Bean Eaters. But a connection between the Giants and, and, the, and the Yankees, 11 years after McCarvey hit the line drive, uh, there are actually five out of 25 men on the Yankee roster who are Giants Philippe Alou, Maddie Alou. Jim Ray Hart, Lindy McDaniel, uh, Hal Lanier, and, uh, and also if you count Sam McDowell and Bobby Mercer, that would make seven. Oh. They didn't finish 10th that, that season. They, they did, there was a season where the Yankees finished 10th of 10. Not many teams can claim that. That was a few wow. years before that. No, there weren't 10 teams in the division back then. I know, I know, but when, when Mantle was at, at the end, uh, Playing first base, I think. Yeah. Marty, can you refresh my memory about the uh, antitrust suit? Because after all, Rockefeller with Standard Oil didn't get away with it. So how did Major League Baseball? They had an exemption. Right. Well, how but did they get an so exemption? To be honest with you, with all my years in baseball, if you were, if the question was, what would happen to baseball if that exemption was lifted? I don't have the slightest. I wrote on that. So when I was in law school, I wrote a prize winning law note on that, which is not quite 70 years old. In the 50s, Tulson versus New York Yankees, they, on the ground of starry, you know, I'm going to mail a copy, although it's obsolete, I'm going to mail a copy (laughs) to Gary and uh, he can send it out. And uh, all other sports are covered by antitrust laws and it's believed from the Stengel hearings and so on, if it ever came up, they would overrule that. They can't say that the game is local and it's beginning and it's end because the suspended game can actually be moved between uh, cities. There's a lot of technical law here and I'm not familiar with it in recent years, but uh, in the year 1964, I was an expert on that subject. I know people have said to me, well, if there was ever a third league and it was a city owned ballpark, the existing Tenant couldn't keep a third team, a third league out. I'm like, yeah, okay, well, that's not going to happen anytime soon. I don't really know the answer. <clears throat> and I suspect that the creation of free agency and everything like that has eliminated a lot of the concerns about the antitrust. That's exemption. right. They know that if the case ever came up, uh, the uh, previous ruling uh, would be uh, overruled and, uh, oh. Oh, that's it. One of these days, I'm going to get a, a 
get around to mailing my 1964 prize winning uh, law note to, um, there you go. to Gary. Well, it's still baffling to me if the most powerful man in America at the time, uh, John D. Rockefeller, he lost, you know, and, and Major League Baseball won the case. It's baffling. All right. To repeat this, you, you, this is a baseball, not a law or a, a webinar, but in the, tw in the 1920s, uh, the Supreme Court ruled that uh, the game is local and in its end and wasn't subject to federal antitrust laws. Um, and then 30 years later, the Supreme Court on Sari decided, they said Congress has had this under its uh, control and has chosen not to overrule and we shouldn't overrule. And it would be overruled today. It pretty much conceded it. And uh, again, since I... Uh, that's about it. And this is not a law lecture. I don't think you want to hear anymore. Gary, can I, <laughs> Gary, can I ask Marty one quick question? Yep. Marty, you uh, said that the best five-man rotation is what the Yankees got now because they use five men. One of the topics that we discuss almost every week, somewhere along the line, is those five guys, what do they go? Are the average of six innings, seven yeah, innings? Right. <laughs> when, you, when you talk about Whitey Ford, well, Whitey Ford actually was one of the first. I mean, he had Louis Arroyo used to come in and relieve him. But the pitchers of the 50s and 60s, they look to go nine innings. Sure. And it's one of the reasons why when people come to me and say, well, this is my list of the 10 greatest pitchers in baseball history. And if I see Roger Clemens on the list, I'm going, how many times did he face a batter with the game on the line? Mm -hmm. So you can't compare today's pitchers to the immortals that we know of. Roger, I'll Clemens. give you a great four-man rotation. Hubble, Schumacher, <laughs> Parmalee, and Fat Freddie Fitzsimmons. 1933 New York Giants. Good. The big four, they were called. What were you going to say, Marty, to uh, I finish that say point? Roger Clemens had seven complete games in his last 10 years. <clears throat> so I don't want to <laughs> hear him in the same conversation with Koufax and Spahn and Marischal and Lefty Grove and Carl Hubble and so Bob Gibson. Yeah. Marty, we can Thanks, Marty. Marty, just a fabulous presentation. Why don't we give it up to Marty Pell? Thank you. Marty, Hello, incredible. Marty. If we, um, again, if they need the uh, books, Amazon and the other one is only available, the pinstripe right now is available on Kindle, correct? Yeah, if you're going to get Pinstripe Empire, which would be nice, Kindle is the way to go if you're used to reading books online because it goes through the 2020 season. But if you like the old fashioned hardcover, actually buy the paperback, which corrected mistakes and goes through 2015 um, and probably cost less. The paperback is good too there. And of Are course, any of your books it, it, on audio? Sorry, Perry? Any of your books on audio? Um, Casey is on audio, okay. um, yeah. because I was the one who recorded it. Okay, Most great. I've ever done that. That was a great I, I'll problem. listen while I'm driving. <laughs> and Marty, if the Giants don't win, we look forward to your new publication, the revised 2022 version. So, <laughs> have a great night and we'll, we will not meet next uh, Thursday, but we will reconvene on uh, June 30th with Neil Shera and his uh, talk about the Polo Grounds. Have a great night, everybody. Again, any of the Sabre members who are from the uh, Stengel chapter, if you're interested in joining us, just email me and uh, we'll get you on the list. Been a pleasure. Have a great night.